Hey, Nathan, are you shopping for a car? Absolutely not. <laughs> Neither am I. But in case you are, I think you'll appreciate this list because we've got the uh, top 10 used cars with the biggest price drops uh, as compiled by our friends over at IC Cars. Yeah, now keep in mind that these particular vehicles, all of this information came from October, so it's a little bit on the late side, but nonetheless, you should still be able to get some pretty good deals on these cars. Yeah, basically, uh, they looked at cars from uh, October of 2022, used cars, to October of 2023, and then they compared, uh, you know, the difference in price, and uh, we've got top 10 cars that have dropped the most. Now, as you know, Nathan, the strike was resolved, the union signed it, uh, and I think we're kind of returning back to normal times where dealers have cars on lots again. Uh, and so um, this might be a good time to buy a new car. But just in case you don't want a new car, there are some deals to be had with used cars. And we're going to go over those. But before we do that, Nathan, uh, let's quickly talk about where we just came from. Yeah, uh, we did yet another trip to Moab, Utah. It was a great trip. Uh, for once, we managed to not have ridiculous traffic or crazy snowfall or anything quite like that. And we did it for a very special video series. Well, not a really a video series, a special video that's been put together that's sort of like a video series. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to kind of... Uh... Uh, stomp on uh, Andre's toes for a second because this is a car podcast. We, of course, have a truck podcast. But what we did was we took three heavy duty trucks, the newest, the greatest, the best, uh, that were lifted, actually, that were made for off-roading. And we took them off-road as part of our cheap truck series. Now, um, we kind of did a twist on that, didn't we? Yeah, this flies in the face of what cheap truck is all about, in fact. The overall cost of these three vehicles uh, was around $300,000. Yeah, we had, of course, the newest Ford, Ram, and Chevy. Actually, it was a GMC. Yeah. Now, two of them uh, had aftermarket components, and one came from the factory with the aftermarket components. So I don't want to give away too much, but to say that we took a lot of stuff and crammed it into one video would be an understatement. Yeah, so we've been doing the series. It's usually four or five episodes. Uh, we're in production on a uh, cheap, tiny truck series. Yes. Uh, but in the meantime, to keep you guys happy and you know to keep the editors busy, we decided uh, to do a cheap, expensive, no, sorry, an expensive truck uh, series, just one episode. And uh, it was pretty fascinating to take these big, burly, they were all diesels, uh, into Moab and see how they off-road. And that video should be up at all TFL as you're listening to this. So if you want to see, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you a kind of a hint. We actually did a really comprehensive test. We did the slowest drag race. Yes. We did the fastest drag race. Yes, we did. We did the MPG challenge. Yes, we did. And then we took them through a bunch of obstacles, including a new one called the Wall. These trucks all did remarkably well. However, they all had their pluses and minuses, and you might be surprised about. Well, the results are surprising, at least for me, I should say. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but you, you had the most comfy truck. You had the brand new uh, GMC uh, 2500 AT4X. Yes, yes, with the AEV package, and it has massaging <laughs> seats. I want to keep How pushing. How much was that truck, Nathan? $104,000. And the uh, <laughs> seats have massage. Wait, 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 I didn't hear that. $104,000 with the massaging <laughs> seats. <laughs> and, yeah, I, w exactly the opposite of what I enjoy covering in terms of just pricing. It was ridiculous, but an amazing, capable truck nonetheless. So I do recommend checking out the series. It should be out right about now, around the time you guys are hearing this, so definitely check it out. Yeah, uh, and so once again, we decided to kind of just have a little bit of fun, and instead of doing cheap trucks, we did very expensive trucks. But we're going right back to cheap trucks. Yeah, yeah, and then we're actually going right back to tiny cheap cheap trucks. Um, so, Nathan, um, do you have any rants you want to share? And by the way, guys, if you're kind of expecting this list to be done in 10 minutes and move on, that's the kind of video we do over at the other seven <laughs> YouTube channels that we manage and right. run. This is our podcast channel, mm -hmm. TFL Talk, and so... We just have a nice conversation for about an hour or so about a whole bunch of things. Uh, and oftentimes, I read the comments, Nathan. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the comments are like, just get to the point. And I'm like, this nah. is not the, this is not nah. the right channel for that. Nah, no yeah, point. yeah, go over to TFL now. We do very brief and concise videos with these lists. But here, we can have fun and talk about all things. Well, this time it was truck, but most of the time it's car related. Speaking of truck and cars, yes. I do have something to say. All right, now, what's your rant, dude? I cannot go into details about a vehicle we recently purchased. <laughs> However, there's something 
that connects this to my rant. And this comes from something that happened the other day as I was driving with producer Zach, by the way. All right. We're cruising down the highway, car pulls ahead of me, and with very little warning, slams on his brakes. Okay, it happens all the time. However, I could barely see the brakes. And it reminded me of something. Oh, yeah, lots of morons out there like to obscure the one safety component on their vehicle that actually communicates what's happening inside the car when you, oh, I don't know, touch the brakes or hit the signal, and that is your brake lights. They cover them with plastic or with tape or with glue or with paint. And it's just like, really, the only thing that prevents people from slamming into you at really high speed is the one thing that you're covering up for a sense of style? I thought that trend had died. No, no, believe me, it's still there. We own a vehicle that has that. That's a hint, guys. Not only that, but it gets better because... Not only do people obscure the taillights, but why stop there? Let's go to the headlights, the one safety device that actually shows you what's happening in front of you when it's dark. Let's find a way to cover that up to make it look a little bit different. And or better yet, let's make it really dark so it doesn't perform as well. That's a great idea. I cannot believe people still do this. More importantly, I can't believe this is legal. You know what I hate? I'll do a rant. Okay? Yeah. This is what I hate. We can give a couple examples of this. Puppies, right? No. Grass I, I, that grows too slow? No, okay. no, no. I like puppies and grass. Both kinds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Oh, yeah. oh, he, he is from Colorado, folks. No, no, no. Just just the kind you cut. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> that doesn't help much, does it? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> the kind you mow. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, seriously. Uh, the, 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 the most drug-like thing I do is iced tea. Iced tea. <laughs> yeah. I've known him for a long time. Okay. Trust me, guys. And anyway, um, so I'm, Tommy and I are driving back from Moab in the Ram 2500 mm -hmm. Cummins, right? And by the way, that thing was uh, going up Bale Pass, 1,400 RPM, dude. Four, it was just like this smooth is something... as butter. Yeah, all of, all of the trucks were pretty Eight, much like, yeah, whatever. 800 pound-foot of torque. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't care. It was incredible. I've never been happier. Uh, and those heavy-duty trucks, I know this is touching once again on Andre's world, but they're such good road-tripping vehicles. Potent potentially. Well, you sit up high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but if you screw up the suspension or do something with the wheels or tires, then you can take what could be an amazing cross-country truck and make it remarkably uncomfortable. I'm not saying that happened, but it does happen. Well, look, if you have a typical 2,500, 3,500, and once upon a time, especially... If you had solid axles, leaf springs, right? Those things were like, uh, like goat carts, right? They were yeah. almost impossible to be comfortable in because every expansion joint, every bump you'd feel. But now the modern trucks like that uh, G GMC we're driving, independent front suspension. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Ram that we have, we lifted it with uh, Fox suspension. Uh, we put on big bulbous tires that we kind of keep a little bit below what we, what is recommended, and it just drives sublimely, dude. Yeah, yeah, they're, it they're floats. It's it's so different because back in the day they were built as a work truck to carry a heavy load and to pull a heavy thing. And once you put a heavy load in those older, then, then they settle duty, down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But now you know they over the past I'd say fifteen years they've really started to dial in the idea that a lot of these trucks are used as commuters and as such they should be more com comfortable and yet still capable of hauling and towing amazing loads and it's happening and yes they're ridiculously expensive but at the same time some of these things are just remarkable yeah so. yeah so very comfortable especially in the lift of trucks you're sitting up high you know on the highway you don't have to worry about parking it you don't have to worry about you know being stuck in traffic and you also feel like there's no amount of weather that's going to stop you Right. No, they really do feel like tanks. Yeah, you feel completely and utterly encased in this giant monster vehicle with big tires and huge range, if they're diesels usually, uh, heated seats, heated steering wheel. We were going, obviously, in the middle of winter over, or close to the middle of winter over Vail Pass. It was such a great feeling to be in those trucks. All right, but here's my rant. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm switching off driving with Tommy. Uh, and we have a Bighorn Ram 2500 that we paid over mm -hmm. $60,000 for, if I recall. Yeah, like before, two years ago. Before yeah. the modifications. Yeah, and we kept this truck because we use it as our towing rig, um, and it's just been a very useful rig. Oh, yeah. But I get in the passenger seat, and I go to adjust it, and guess what? Hmm. It's manual. <gasps> oh, no! No, but this is what I hate. This this stupid, just, uh, like, petty cost-cutting where the driver's seat is... Electric, but the passenger seat is manual. I'm thinking it must cost Ram more to actually 
engineer a manual seat on the passenger side versus well, why don't you just put electric seats and, and it gets worse right that's oh. okay now you're making fun of me right you're, oh, yeah you're oh being, yeah i'm, well, I'm ready baby to give you a hug okay, do you yeah. want a hug how about the headlights okay the headlights are terrible they're just terrible they suck that i agree with and that's jeep that's that's not just Stellantis, actually that's the other car companies too why not put the highest end headlights in there? They're really not that much more nowadays for these proper LEDs that really fire well, as opposed to these really crappy older incandescent ones that have been proven by various companies to be this less is effective. A, this is a safety thing. Exactly. And, and, you know, a big horn is not exactly the most expensive. No, it's big and horny. It's great. But I'm saying in, in the model lineup, but it's yeah. also not the cheapest. So uh, I would hope that when you get to over $60,000, they put, you know, relatively... Uh, good creature comforts in the truck and not make you feel like, you know, you should have spent more money on the next level up. And I think that's the whole purpose, right? That's yeah. what they're trying to do. Yeah. They're trying to get you to go to the next of level. Of course they are. But but when it comes to safety devices, and this is the same thing with uh, what they used to do way back in the day with ABS. Remember, it was only reserved for the high-end cars. And then suddenly, oh, yeah, the, there's a mandate. Now it's got to be all cars. Reverse cameras. Now it's got to be all cars. Uh, TPMS. Now it's got to be all cars. Basically, you, you have to wait until there's a requirement. But then you get up to this point now where we are where the regular headlights are fairly effective, but the nicer headlights, the higher priced LEDs really aren't that much more expensive, folks. And they're not putting them in vehicles. And I think that that's a safety issue. Yeah, I'm not asking for laser headlights. Yeah. I'm just asking for lights that actually light up the road at night as opposed to, you know, two incandescent candles. As, yeah, as if somebody's the, holding an oil lamp in front of you or something. And, you know, the people... And the manufacturers that are actually driving this in a good way uh, are the Japanese. So Andre just came back from uh, the Toyota Tacoma Tacoma drive, and he uh, drove the cheapest Tacoma. Yeah, yeah, actually the very cheapest that you can get. Currently. And do you know that you get all of the safety sense? Yeah, the the safety sense. Toyota two point is it either two point or three point oh? It's three point oh. I think it's three point oh, but yeah. you get it in every single. Toyota, including the cheapest Tacoma. Yes. And that includes things like blindside monitoring, mm -hmm. which, you know, uh, is a great safety tool. Oh, yeah. Um, Collision the, mitigation. mitigation. Yeah. Uh, good headlights. Yes. Yeah. And, and all the Japanese are doing that. Yes. Nissan's doing that as well with the majority of their vehicles. I think all of them now, including their and Honda least does, expensive. And Honda does it all. Yeah. But yet, yet, like, companies like the American brands, you know, have decided that if you want to be safe – you're going to have to pay for the higher end trim levels. And, and I think that's wrong. I really you want to survive that accident, son. You're going to have to pay up some money. You're going to have to get yourself, if you're, you know, if you're in Ford world, it's going to be, uh, you know, the premium or, uh, it's, or it, the King Ranch. Or, or check those three boxes to make sure that you actually get that. So that $30,000 <laughs> car is now a $40,000 car. Or truck. Truck or truck. Yeah, but we're talking about cars here. So yeah. anyway. So there's a, there's a lot of this. It just feels like, you know, stupid cost cutting for the sake of cost cutting and you feel you want to feel like when you buy a product um, you spent a lot of money on this you want to get in the thing you want to feel and you who's really bad at this porsche porsche is horrible at this. <laughs> porsche actually i think they just uh, charged you for saying their name <laughs> you're gonna get a thing in the mail saying by the way oh it's a dollar shice and look porsche i get because look the people who are buying porsches probably are not stretching, or if you are stretching, maybe you should, if you want a 911, you should be getting it a 996. It doesn't matter. I see, that's the thing, is that I, I don't care whether or not they think that you're rich or you're not rich, but there's a point to nickel and diming people. There is, okay. I think I, it's I, bad I, business. I, I, yeah, I agree. I think it creates, you know, and, and people have, especially with like Porsche, they have kind of come to accept it, that Porsche is kind of this great company at, at making you pay for stuff that every other auto manufacturer, you know, would include. So, you know, we just bought a 911. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't have blind spot monitoring. Yeah. 158,000. Yeah, exactly. It just it doesn't have blind spot monitoring. doesn't have adaptive cruise control. That's a $2,000 package. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, I, I, it's hard to cry crocodile, crocodile, crocodile tears for people who are spending this much money. Yeah. It, and I'm sure a lot of you are going, oh, I'm sorry, Roman, about your Porsche. But, but here's the thing is that Porsche actually means in German, bend over and take it. <laughs> Um, it, it's ridiculous, though. One of the most, the premier automaker, I mean, many of you may agree that Porsches are some of the most fantastic driver vehicles ever. A really fantastic car company on the absolute bleeding edge of tech. But I, I agree no with some, blind spot monitoring? I, I agree with some of the stuff that they do. If you want four-wheel steering, you know. 
Okay, fair and, enough. Fair and, enough and, with that. And, and tee up if you want that little clock, you know, the chrono package. Oh, yeah, that's going to be $10,000, yeah, right? And tee up, but, but blindside monitoring? Uh, blind spot. Let's give us give us one of your children and a kidney, and then we'll that's, give you one. That's, come on, Porsche. That's just a safety feature. Well, that's exactly my point. That should be, like like Japanese, it should be. By the way, BMW card. pulls that stuff, too, and they've been doing that for a little while. Hmm. Lots of extra stuff that he's like, you know, really, I'm, I have to pay for this? It's ridiculous. So, anyway, we could easily go into a rant about certain German car companies that charge you way too much for no apparent reason other than to fill their own pockets and not for your own safety because they don't care. But we're going to continue <laughs> onto this list. I think th I think they do care, but I just think No, they don't. I think they just think they can make more money. And they do. It, it, makes, it, it helps their bottom line. Uh, standard safety, I think, that it, w it would be a better bottom hey, line. Hey, before we get into this list, let's talk about some cars. And I've got, I've got some thoughts about what's happening in 2024. We'll, of course, do... Uh, our typical coming up soon episode about you know the cars that died, the cars that were most interested yeah, that's in driving. Guys. These are things that obviously you know car uh, magazines and YouTube channels do at the end of the year. So those are coming up. But let me let me kind of uh, uh, run something by you. Mm, yeah, I please. believe that 2024 will be the year of the plug-in hybrid. That's no surprise. That's no surprise given where the market's going, where everything else is going, where Toyota's going. Toyota's been leading the way with this. They have been pushing hard, and I think people are finally listening. More importantly, consumers are listening. I think consumers have figured out what the car companies haven't figured out, and that is they want choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the plug-in hybrid, so from an engineering point of view, the plug-in hybrid is just a really bad solution, right? You're carrying around more weight because you're carrying around two powertrains, yep. usually an internal combustion engine and an electric motor and a battery to power that. Yep. So if you're an engineer, you're like, this is a really bad solution. But, Nathan, if you're a car buyer, like my lovely wife, it's a perfect solution yep. because you never have to actually worry about public charging it because you could go to the gas station and fill it up with, Gas, gas. And just drive it. Or if you want to feel good about driving without creating more pollution, you can plug it in at home overnight. And if, you know, depending on the range, uh, if your range is, let's say, anywhere between 25 and 40 miles to get to work, you can drive it without using the engine ever. And a lot of places at work now have chargers. My mm -hmm. wife has chargers. You could plug it in there and then drive it home without ever having to use gas. Yeah, yeah, the reality is is that you could drive the vehicle as an electric vehicle with regular commuting, which is one of the points that they've been making with these. And you know what the most pop this, this is this is I think a punctuation to my point. You know what mm. the most popular plug-in hybrid in America is right now? I actually do. What is that? It's the Jeep Wrangler 4 by E. Yeah, think about that. The Jeep Wrangler 4 by the most off-road worthy Jeep they make, but the flip side of that is the most uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't think it's so bad, but it, it's not perfect. Right, I mean, the, the windshield's straight up. Yeah. The seats are straight Are erect, but so straight am up. I, so it's all good. You know, the doors come off, so they're... That's all right. That's okay. <laughs> It, it, it it's, it's compromised. They're expensive, a, is my issue. It's 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 you know solid axles, so mm. you know, road holding is is certainly more off road worthy than on road worthy. I'm just saying, as an on road car, is very compromised. Yeah, it's and, not the most efficient, and yet it's the most popular. And Tom, I told this to Tommy, and you know what Tommy said, and he's right. Mm. He said that that's because Jeep is only selling four by E's. Yeah, actually, some <laughs> markets, including I believe California, uh, they'll only be selling the four by E's unless you special order. Uh, a yes. non four by e version, but that but that still doesn't mean uh, you know that they can control the entire market of plug in yeah. hybrids. So I, I just think that the plug in hybrid, from a car buyer's point of view, is a perfect solution, uh, and I think that's what's going to be kind of um, popular and trending, certainly in 2024, if not later. So it's kind of like dipping your foot or your toe in the EV pool, but you're not completely diving in at the deep end. No, no, it's. There are certain car companies, a really good example would be like Hyundai Kia, who have seen that people want choice across the board. So they have electrics, they have regular gas, they have plug-in hybrids, they have regular hybrids. Smart thing to do, because then you get people more to work with. But I wanted to bring up something about um, PHEVs, plug-in hybrids, which some people may not uh, think about. And I talked about this with an engineer, one from Toyota, actually, and one from Nissan. And I actually asked the Nissan guy, why don't you have more of these? And he's like, dude, it's expensive, it's hard for us to do. I get it. But... Here's something to consider. A lot of you are like, well, there's, it's extra complex because you have these two things. You're absolutely right. And it's more weight. Yep, you're absolutely right there. However, the engine in a plug-in hybrid tends to work less hard 
because it's first of all backed by an electric motor and also more often you will be driving it in all electric mode meaning that even though there is more complexity the gas engine at the very least will be working less hard than just a regular version of that vehicle as such it may last actually longer now don't take my word for it you can actually go back and look at some of the earlier prius primes that were out there and how they're doing in terms of their reliability quite good actually prius in general actually pretty damn reliable car the system works and as long as other people are adopting that type of technology i agree with roman i do think that 2024 a lot of people are going to be like wow you know i i only have to go to the gas station once a month if that and i'm commuting and doing everything else this isn't such a bad thing the only thing i wish i wish they would make a more affordable plug-in hybrid the least expensive one still close to 50 grand yeah and you could see, you know you could see it coming you could see the wave coming with like the uh, rav4 prime those mm -hmm. are still almost, they're, they're ridiculously expensive and unobtainium yeah. and it just shows you how much people want it the other thing that's happened is there's been this kind of confluence of technology that's made these vehicles not just popular but actually relatively fuel efficient and i'll Give you an example of that, right? Once upon a time when we were young, Nathan, if you wanted 300 horsepower, you needed a bloody V8. Yeah, or turbocharged V, twin turbocharged V6 or something like that. Or something like yeah, that, yeah. right? Well, even those when we were kids weren't around. But now, dude, you can get 300 horsepower out of a Corolla GR. Mm -hmm. That's a little three cylinder. little three cylinder, you know, turbo that puts out 300 horsepower. So you don't need huge internal combustion engines to get big power. Yeah. And so with the, the Jeep, for instance, I think that's a two liter. Four cylinder it's turbo. It's a two, li two liter four cylinder turbo, but then it's backed by, of course, the electric motor that's sandwiched between the transmission and the engine. So, so you don't need these giant engines, and then when you add an electric motor to them, it becomes actually a very elegant engineering solution. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I agree, Nathan. Like I just, you know, test drove the Lamborghini, which is a twelve cylinder that's been hybridized. Yeah, that's yeah. a whole different thing we're talking about. It is indeed. They, they in fact, get this. They in fact put the plug for the car in the frunk. So who's going to actually like leave their frunk open and plug it in outside, right? That, that is pure performance. So that hybrid system is just meant to, to make that Lamborghini more powerful. I could just see a billionaire in Qatar like opening up the hood and just like, no, 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 no. Yeah, those, those will never be plugged in. Yeah. But for the rest of us. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Um, and there, by the way, are, there is at least one plug-in hybrid that I can clearly see on this list that we're about to go into, by the way, for those of you who yeah, are Yeah, and we can talk about that. So let's just jump to the list. Yeah. Uh, right, we're going to go in typical TFL order. Uh, at, let's refer, we'll tell them what we're doing. Yeah, at number 10, top 10 used cars with the biggest price drops uh, is the Range Rover Velar price drop 17 Point seven percent in October of 2022. It was fifty-one thousand in on average, thirty-one bucks, and it dropped to forty-two thousand five hundred eleven. That's and a hell of a drop. And, and part of that uh, is because there's a new Velar, so that was the old Velar. Mm -hmm. So you know, whenever the car is being refreshed or has been around a while, um, prices tend to drop. But I have an issue with the Velar that goes beyond that, and it's probably just my issue. I actually, when it first came out, I thought it was like. Uh, Oh, just a beautiful design, mm. uh, almost a concept car that they brought to life. Uh, and then I took it off-road, and oh, my God, it was horrible, Nathan. It, and, and, and it does have all the off-road goodies, but basically to take it off-road, you have to put it in its highest, you know, it has to be on stilts then. And basically on tippy toes. And, and I could not take it because we were in uh, uh, Joshua Tree, and we were going down this rutted-out trail, and my back, I have a bad back, and it was just beating me up, beating me up, and I could not take it anymore. And so I was begging to let us put it into regular mode so that there was some suspension travel. And every time we did, one of the uh, Range Rover drivers would be like, car number five, have you noticed that you're not in off-road mode? And I'd be like, yes, I know, it's on purpose. So so, so to me, uh, that is that car um, just never worked for what I would want yeah. to use it for. It's also kind of that funky size. So, you know, Range Rovers tend to be big, luxurious, autobiograph. This, this, is, this is a little bit bigger than an Evoque, but still pretty small. And because of the way it's designed, it doesn't have a lot of room on the inside. Yeah, um, it, it, it's never been one of my favorites. In fact, it's one of my least favorites. I even like the Discovery Sport more than that. Now, speaking of Discovery, yeah, the next so what's one number, what's number nine? is the regular Land Rover Discovery with a price drop of 17.9%. That's from October 22 to 23 uh, so it was $45,242 in October 22. It dropped, to check this out, $37,131 in 2023. 
That is a hell of a drop. Well, part of this list you'll see uh, is really kind of large, uh, luxurious uh, people SUVs. movers. Yeah, SUVs. They have just they were they just they they ran up to ridiculous numbers, uh, as we'll find out with the next car on the list. And then, of course, they had to fall off that cliff. It was just unsustainable the amount of money people were paying. Now, I I personally like the Land Rover Discovery. I think it's actually a really good car. Uh, I, it's better than the Velar. Yeah, it's better than the Velar. The styling is very polarizing. People tend to hate that asymmetrical license plate bracket on the back of the thing. That's the worst part of it. Yeah, uh, but but I like it. But the problem, once again, um, is Jerry McGovern, the guy who designs these things, and that is he took what was you know a car that was square-jawed and very masculine and made it very elegant, uh, more of a urban off-roader than an off-roader off-roader. It's, it's not even an off-roader. It doesn't look like an it off-roader. It doesn't look like an no, off-roader, And that's yeah. the thing is that, but, but I think because the, the, the uh, Defender came out, that made it okay to build the Discovery. Right, but the Discovery came out before the Defender. No, I know. But, but the point is, is that it made it okay for the Discovery to exist because now you have the Defender out there and the Defender is that square-jawed off-road looking kind of mean vehicle as opposed to this thing, which is... I, I would argue the new Defender isn't the square... The old Defender was a square jaw. No, the, the, the new Defender is great. The new Defender is, uh, you know, they, they, they made it much more modern. What is their best-selling vehicle? And they made it very off-road worthy looking. No, it's, But have you seen underneath it? There's, I mean, protection is silly. The protection's bad. The tires and wheels are bad. Yeah. But the, From the factory. You the can, the you tech can. is really good. We managed to do very well with it in Moab. And even though your son managed to destroy the tires twice, it still <laughs> got through Red Cone eventually. It did so, not. It, it, we had a, we didn't we had a, it. It didn't go through didn't Red, go Red Cone. Okay, speaking <laughs> of Land Rover products, here's another one. Look, I don't, I don't mean to take a dump. I love Land Rover. We just bought... A a Range Rover, actually. Uh, we I, have six Land Rover products we here do. at TFL. Yeah, Tommy has an LR3, uh, Case has an LR3, and Alex has an LR3. So so we're huge fans of Land Rover and Range Rover. So I'm not trying to, like, I, I know I sound like a hater. I love the brand. I love what it represents. Um, I just uh, kind of wish that... Uh, they were cheaper. No. Yeah, I wish they, they were cheaper. I wish they were... And I'm not even going to go, you know, you think I'm going to say more reliable. I'm not even going to say that. I just wish they were more more uh, off-roady in their appearance. Uh, uh, okay. You know, you know more, no, more first, t- for, you know, last generation Defender. Okay. Kind of like the Ineos. I think, you know, obviously we're hopefully getting an Ineos Grenadier. And that's kind of the <sighs> spiritual successor to the old. To Defender. the old one, yes. Yeah. But you know you you have to look at reality. I kind of feel like what, they left that 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 whole segment behind, and I wish they hadn't. There's a very interesting commentary on that, which is: Do you know how hard it is for moms and dads to really like driving vehicles oh, with straight know. axles? I, I, I completely understand it. Yeah. Uh, it makes, and I'm sure they sold the bejesus out of uh, the Defender, the new one. Yeah, and, and the old a, one was a tractor. I get it. Yeah, the new but, one is actually quite good. It just isn't perfect. And also, you haven't taken your uh, Geritol today. So let's move on to the did, next one. Did you one. talk about the price on the Discovery? How much? Mm, you yes, I did. Uh, $37,131 uh, used in yeah. 2023 of October. So let's move down on to from, another. Down from 45, yeah. Yep. Land Rover, Range Rover. Hmm, that sounds familiar. That's what we bought it. We, <laughs> ours was $113,000 like 2017, and I got it for 45. Yes, yes, and next year it'll be worth 25. It will be. <laughs> uh, so the price drop is 18.3% uh, on the Range Rover. Uh, October 2022, they were $85,298. <laughs> October 2023, $69,650. And dropping quickly. Yes, wait another year and it'll be in the 40s. So the reason we bought our Range Rover long wheelbase was because I love the brand. I love the car. It's a hell of a car. And I want to prove that maybe it's more reliable than people think. So we are flying without a parachute, Nathan. We don't have an extended warranty. No. And I, I am completely aware of the fact that if one of those uh, uh, you know, air suspension uh, shocks breaks or you know, the little, the little puck that comes up <laughs> doesn't come up, it's going to be very expensive. Dude, if your compass breaks, it's going to be $10,000. <laughs> the bottom line is that uh, so far... 
the vehicle made it to Moab and back quite well, and the guys did take it off road, and, and Tommy did beat up on it a little bit, and they've been using it as a, like a daily driver. So, knock on wood, so far so good. So let's let's before we continue with this, let's take a little bit of a digression here, as we like to do over at TFL Talk. Uh, you know what I figured out, and this is probably very uh, uh, self-evident, but until you buy a lot of cars like we've been doing over the last fifteen years, this past year uh, TFL's bought thirty cars. Have we? Yes, we have. You sure, thirty. Ever? Yeah, I, I hung out with Zach. We hung, we bought thirty. Wow. Yes. And sold most of them. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we buy them, we do series, and we sell them. But what I, I have found is, I think the number one thing that is uh, determinative—is that a word? Determinative of yeah, how it. how well the vehicle will perform and last, and you know, not be uh, albatross around your neck is how well it was taken care of by the previous owner. Of course. In other words, how much it was loved. Yes. I so, mean, that makes total sense. So that, the reason, one of the reasons, I, and probably one of the main reasons I bought that Range Rover was uh, it was very much loved. It, you know, I had the Carfax. You could see every service was done on time at the uh, Range Rover Land Rover dealership. Mm -hmm. You know, that car, whoever had that car, I think it was Ashley, thank you, Ashley, loved it, loved it, loved it. The only brand that I found that you can get away with not doing the maintenance is Toyota. Toyota seems to be not completely bulletproof, but but you, you have a sense that even if it was neglected to some extent, it'll still go and go into the two, the maybe 250, 250. It's a very mileage. general statement. I, it is a very I, general I, statement. Yeah. I, here's a quick, quick tip for you guys. Right. Uh, and this comes from somebody, I used to have to buy cars for a used car lot and for a wrecking yard. And a really quick way to see whether or not the car was taken care of right off the bat is to see whether or not the tires are in decent shape. If they're bald or good, if they're, good, you know, it just tip. just a really simple, fast way to go, oh, okay, half of them are bald and mistreated and they're really, you know, poorly, poorly taken care of tires. Most likely that car has led a hard life. And that's just like your very first tip. There's a million other things you can do, yeah, but let's, we'll, let's do go, an, let's, we'll do a whole let's, podcast. Let's go through a couple. I can give you another oh, one. Oh, sure. There's off plenty. Of my head. Uh, if the wheels are curved. Easily, yeah. Yeah, because if the That's wheels are curved yeah. and then not fixed, you can kind of tell that whoever drove it, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say neglected it, but certainly didn't care enough. Well, if they ran it into a curb, that could already be bad for everything from your tires to, of course, your alignment. Another, another one is the first thing we check is the oil. Mm. Uh, that recent vehicle we just bought uh, for our cheap truck series, cheap tiny truck series, first thing I did, check the oil. Oil was brand new. So if and that that could of course be you know a dealer yes of course <laughs> changing it, but if you're buying it from an individual and they've bothered to change the oil and you can tell right if the oil is brown and clear uh, and viscous, perfect. If it's sludgy and black and uh, you know it's got particles in it, you can feel then it could be a bit of an issue. Yes, yeah. of course, and just the engine bay itself, you can clearly see whether or not there's been oil spurted or dried little chemicals here and there whether or not things have been actually taken care of or where they've used a baseball to shove it into a where the radiator cap should go. Things like that that are pretty obvious. You know, once again, just a quick glance, you can tell. Um, there is something very interesting about the interior of a car. You never want to buy a smoker's car. I, I was just about to go there, yeah. And yeah. it's not, not just smoker now. Vapors. Now you got vapors because then it smells like the inside. And I've never been in a French bordello, but this is what I imagine one to um, smell like uh, because oh. vaping... Also gets into the vehicle and it mm. gets it gets into it in this insidious way where not only do you have that underlying nicotine smell, mm -hmm. right? That kind of kind of harsh, kind of like almost uh, as uh, aesthetic, no, not aesthetic, uh, acidic, acidic kind of you know what I mean? Yeah. Smell that burns your nose, but then you have this overly sweet scent of cherry or. Uh, peppermint or whatever the heck the person was. Yeah, making. the French warehouses only use peppermint, by the way. Okay. So you know. right. I mean, so I've read. Okay. Anyway, uh, but the, uh, we're, we're going to get in trouble. We just got an email. Here, I'll read you this email. Oh, yeah, do that. Uh, well, I, I have do to that real quick for about smoking okay, uh, while I, you're doing that. Okay, go ahead. I got to apologize. This, uh, this yeah, guy. I'm, I am just messing around. Come on. Uh, so make sure, like, remove the ashtray because you can see if there's ashes behind the ashtray that are, like, hanging out there. It's one way to tell if there's a smoker or if there's usually a hole in the headliner or the seat or something like that because of a smoker. Or you actually would look over the shoulder where the rubber is before the window and that gas area and if you peel it back a little bit you'll clearly see some ash in there that's where somebody who's lived in the vehicle and used it as an ashtray another thing is that if it looked like it had an uber or lyft sticker on it i would avoid it because most likely that vehicle has had a 
very hard life and most likely vaped in. Yes, I'm sorry, Uber and Lyft people, but almost every single one that I've been in smells like it's been vaped in. Almost every single one. Not that I mind because it reminds me of my youth. I'm trying to find this email. Uh, is it the one about the um, yeah, saying about the whether or not a car has been... Um, no, about us being too crude. And, oh, we're uh, way too crude. Okay. I'm trying, do you have that email? Because I really no, love to read it to I, our... I, I, I delete them. I usually send them to young children. I mean, come on. They, it's just... Guys, we try to keep relatively PG, but PG doesn't mean G, okay? We're not Disney. And at the same time, we're just being real. You want us to completely be fake and just like, oh, no, gosh, that's a... That's a diddly thing you said right there. No, it's not us. All right. All right. All right. And all right here, here. This, okay. this comes from Isaac. Isaac. Okay. All right. So, and this is why I feel bad now. He said, uh, "Good day, all. I have been listening and watching TFL for seven, several years. Then I thoroughly enjoy the videos, information, reviews you provide. However, the videos are now not so family friendly, Nathan. Mm. Uh, Nathan has." Been adding sexual innuendos. I just did earlier. And crass jokes at other team members' expense. It's actually embarrassing yeah. to me to hear some of these. And I can now no longer have my children ages three and five around when I watch, listen to these, which is quite sad. And this makes me sad. Uh, I try to I try to be careful what they watch and hear. For instance, on one of the more recent TFL Talk epitho- episodes, uh-huh. that would be here, <laughs> Nathan jokes about sending stripper gram to uh, uh, Roman. That must be when I was in the hospital with my blood clots. And there are other instances. Oh, she didn't get there? <laughs> no, she didn't get there. Videos <laughs> Sorry, that are just Isaac. as blatant. I would be delighted if TFL could return to keeping the videos family friendly so <sighs> that you can resume watching these at leisure even with my kids around. Keep up the good work. So, Isaac, I apologize for Nathan. And Sorry. I, I actually am myself. Uh, uh, you it's more than me. You do. I, I, uh, you do. I, I sometimes do, but it's not on purpose. I kind of just – it slips out. Yeah. It and it's has, only one word. But, it's, Isaac, it's do you want us to be completely fake? Because if you want us to be completely fake and not even remotely ourselves, then whatever personality we inject in here is going to pretty much dissipate, disappear, and it's going to turn into something that perhaps you want, but maybe our other viewers don't want. So I'll tell you what. I will make an effort not to talk about strippers very often, French whorehouses, or other nasty things that might come along in turning uh, coitus I mentioned recently. Oh, and I, so I'm going to try, I'm gonna try to, to back off a little bit, but the reality is, is that people want to be entertained by this, and they know who we are, and this is who we are, and this is who we've been for 14 years. You know, the, the reason I feel sad about it is, you know, we've always tried to be family friendly. We've always tried to make this a show that... At a, a PG level. That, that a dad and a son, or a mother and a daughter, or a mother and son, you know, whatever you want to put together, can watch, and you feel comfortable with. Uh, but here on the on the podcast specifically, I think you get kind of the raw and unedited. And, and you know, it could be much raw and much more unedited. Believe me, they keep me on a leash. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've listened, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and, and, you know, we are by far... One of the cleanest, yes, like, yeah, in the automotive yes, world. Yes, yeah, so, so I think, you know, here we're a little bit more unfiltered, and, um, and, and you know, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and to keep ourselves kind of sane, we enjoy having this honest conversation mm. with uh, our viewers and readers and listeners. Uh, and so if every so often, you know, uh, you a fly reference off rails. That, that you feel uncomfortable with um, falls out, I apologize. But maybe, you know, we've got seven other channels where we're not talking about. Yeah, all of our video presentations are, are very clean. Yes. Uh, yeah, our podcasts are, are horribly dirty. Infected, <laughs> apparently, by me. As this sounds like... Isn't that horribly Isaac, dirty? No, Isaac keeps coming back to me. So, Isaac, I totally get it. I apologize. I will resign as of tomorrow. But as it stands right now, look. This is us. This I'm is not who- taking your resignation. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that just doesn't. Okay. But the point is, is that, and I want the you other You know who viewers- should resign? Hmm. I was watching this. Now we're going to get into topical stuff. Oh, here we go. And this is going to get even worse. Oh, God. <laughs> but uh, I was watching, uh, today, when we're taping this, uh, the Cybertruck is going to be unveiled. But yesterday, um, Mr. Musk did a one-hour uh, oh, interview. Oh, I saw, man. And basically, <laughs> basically <laughs> told the uh, advertisers on X to go F himself. F themselves, yeah. Isaac, I didn't say the whole word. And then, you know, uh, who was in the audience, the CEO of Twitter. <laughs> and if I were her, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> I'm tapping out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. She was specifically brought in to bring the advertisers back. <laughs> yeah, and he basically was like, no. <laughs> you know what, though? Honestly, honestly, I, I don't I don't dislike him for his honesty. I don't at all. I, I appreciate that, actually. It's just a question of if I were somebody who held stock in that company, I'd be like, ah. Here's the problem with that, okay, Nathan? Mm-hmm. Here's the problem. When you say something like that, 
to your advertisers. There's going to be a certain percentage of people out there who are going to be like, yeah, you tell them, you, you know, you, you, you're unvarnished, you know, this is free speech, right? Sure. But there's going to be, I would wager, a larger percentage of people thinking to themselves, if you say that to your advertisers, you're, you know, not far from saying that to your customers mm -hmm. or your investors, yeah. right? You, you, you see the problem, right? I can see how the or your fans is definitely it, 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 right. Because yeah. if, if if you're bold, if you're that bold to you, you know, he's a 52 year old man, Nathan. Yeah. You know, gosh darn it. There's there's like this weird masculinity that that's like floating around right now where it's like it's like guys chest bumping themselves and trying to prove who's the bigger man and that has nothing to do with masculinity. You know you know how I judge masculinity? Please how, tell me. I'll tell you. I'll tell you how do you take care of your family? How do you care about the ones that are uh, worse off than you are. How do you care about the ones that are, you know, in greater pain than you are? Mm. That to me is real, real masculine. I respect people who, who go out of their way uh, to take care of those who are less lucky or le you know what I mean. Or well, I would agree. That's and a, I know that sounds that's very a sign of a good person. I know that sounds like a bleeding heart thing. It is that too. But once upon a time, this is what America was about, right? Yeah. We, th this is what made us the greatest country in the world was. And I'm, I'm verging on politics. So I'm going to shut up and go to number five. He's going to shut up and go to number five. But just so you know, Isaac, seriously, and I will come back to your name three or four more times. I number apologize. six, sorry, number six. Um, but I really don't want to alienate your family. I have kids as well. Uh, I've already alienated them, but the point is, is that I'm not trying to do that in order to upset you. I'm merely trying to be just who I am. So imagine going to work and telling somebody who you're working with who's just being a regular person. They're not being outrageous. They're just being themselves, but you're telling them, you know what? That makes me uncomfortable. Can you not be yourself anymore? I always have an issue with that because to me, a real man does at least express themselves in a way that they feel is genuine. And being a genuine human being, which is sort of what Roman was touching on, I think is a fair shake of what a proper dude is. I cannot comment on what a proper female is because I'm not one, but I do have some in my family and all of them are smart, well-educated and caring all at the same time. So there it is. Okay. And they put up with you. Oh, my God, they do. They do put up with you. All right, number and Isaac does too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Isaac. Okay. All right, number six, BMW uh, 5 Series Hybrid. Uh, price drop 18.7%. Uh, price October 2022, 37000 down to 30000 uh, Now, you know, I just said 2024 was going to be the year of the hybrid, but I, I did not like the 5 Series Hybrid, Nathan. No, I actually... You know, we, we, we've tested They it. had the EV version of that, yeah. and I loved it. Yeah. I thought it was better than the hybrid. Yeah. And so it's it's a exactly contour to... Or contour? Contour? counter to what Roman was saying earlier about next year being the year of the hybrid, uh, at least with BMW, I don't know what the hell they're doing, but some of their EVs are great and some of them stink and some of their hybrids are great and some of them stink. They're just like so polarizing if, one if, side if or I, the other. Look, if I, look, the Jeep ostensibly gets about 25 miles of range of all electricity, mm -hmm. which to me is kind of the bottom of where it becomes usable and practical. And if it's I remember the, the five series- The closer to 20. Yeah, yeah, and the uh, and the Grand Cherokee is probably close to thirty. Yeah, uh, but the five series hybrid, at least the one we tested, was was a small battery mm. and, and it didn't go very far. No. Um, number five on our list is the Chrysler Pacifica hybrid, and this just got uh, Consumer Report just basically rung this one through the the ringer. Yeah, uh, and it came I think in dead last and it, for and reliability. For reliability, yeah. yeah. I and so that. so that this could be. Um, Part of its 20% price drop uh, from 41,000 down to 33,000, and I like the Pacifica uh, hybrid. I think it's um, I think it's really good. The only thing I don't like about it is it doesn't come in all-wheel drive. Actually, quick story: yeah. Roman and I, when we first started really doing video, like seriously doing videos, I would say around 2010 or so, um, we had a couple of minivans that we drove around. They were fine, but both he and I had a discussion at lunch, and we were saying, you know, why aren't these things hybrids or plug-in hybrids? Even back then, there was a really early tech, right, in terms of plug-in hybrids. But we were questioning it because it's like, this is the perfect vehicle to make that happen. There's no reason why it shouldn't. And we questioned it, but we didn't really go too vocal with it. Later on, the Pacifica Hybrid comes along, the only PHEV available in our market. And when it first came out, it was a bit of a revolution for minivans because other car companies are like, oh, wait, that's not a bad idea. Toyota at least took the hybrid idea and really made it rock. But the thing about the Pacifica is ever since it's come out, it's never been updated. Not really. And it's still the same vehicle it was four years ago. 
And I think that that's part of the problem. And then, yes, of course, they're making them not very reliable, which could be an issue as well. But the idea behind it is still sound. It's a smart idea. Yeah, there's this weird thing uh, that we really feel uh, very uh, strongly here in Colorado because we're in, obviously, a snow state. And that is whenever they build a vehicle and they make it a hybrid, then they don't create an all-wheel drive version of that. And that doesn't make sense to us. Right, it doesn't make sense. And I know that uh, the engineers will say, for the, there is a Chrysler all-wheel drive. Obviously, it's not the hybrid, but they'll tell you that the battery is in between the drive shaft, so you can't get a drive shaft with a battery. But that just is an engineering issue that they could obviously solve. Oh, yes, like they could. Like by having an electric motor in the back. Exactly, as to which a drive is shaft. really the direct. And Toyota pioneered that. Yeah. They've been doing it for years. It works. It works well. The other, the other company that really bothers me that does that is, uh, and this is actually even more astounding, is, of course, the Maverick. You can't get the hybrid in all-wheel drive, even though it's based on the Escape, which you can get as a hybrid in all-wheel drive. Yes, I know. And that is a vehicle that I would have bought had it been all-wheel drive with the hybrid because I wanted that good mileage. My my little thing, my, my Santa Cruz, it's fine, but it doesn't get great mileage. And I wanted better mileage. That was the one thing I really wanted. And honestly, had Ford built the Maverick with a hybrid all-wheel drive system, I would have bought it without batting and, an eyelash. And for all of you product planners... Uh, that are out there, you know, creating these kind of stupid ass uh, uh, models that don't have usefulness. For, think about it this way: here's here's the choice you're giving Nathan and myself mm. with the Maverick. You can either have a car that has all-wheel drive, or you can have a car you can drive in the winter. I mean, you can either have a car that has good fuel economy, or yeah. you can have a car you can drive in the winter. Pick one. You can't have it both. And you know what ends up happening? We find something else. Exactly. You're not you're not selling more Mavericks. You're not selling more Pacificas. All you're doing is turning a lot of potential customers away who will find an alternative that is both fuel efficient and available in four-wheel drive. Yeah, I or agree 100%. Um, I, I want to, before we move on, I want to say one more thing, and that is, yes, the Mavericks is an extremely big hit for Ford, and I'm very happy for them, and I think it's a great vehicle. Once again, I almost bought one, but... Other automakers are coming along, and they're building some interesting vehicles, and now you have to start thinking about whether or not you're serving your entire market, even for people who live in California and Florida who don't necessarily need all-wheel drive all the time. They still go camping. and they Or still skiing. Go, or skiing or whatever. A lot and, of people in Texas are right now here in Colorado. <laughs> yes. And there's a lot of people in Texas that are like, wow, all-wheel drive would have really helped when my neighborhood was flooded. Or frozen. Or frozen. So... There is something to be said about that nowadays with the new type of all-wheel drive systems that have the electric motor powering the rear wheels. Those things are remarkably efficient. So, yeah, it's something to think about. Hey, let's play a game. Hmm. All right, I'm going to play a game. And you right. guys can play along, okay? When we were kids, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about, like, the late 80s, all right? <laughs> you weren't a kid in the late 80s, Roman. You were a full-grown adult. So when I was in high school. <laughs> okay, that wasn't the late 80s either. That was the early 80s. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Sorry, but no, no, no. I, I, I respect that. <laughs> when we were uh, younger, younger in the late '80s. <laughs> okay, if I remember right, there were only four, maybe five cars that you could get in all-wheel drive. I'm not talking about trucks. No, no, you, cars. You, you could cars. So let's so, see if you can name those four or five okay, cars. Okay, well, well, obviously some Subarus. So you know there was a variety. There were a couple different yes. Subarus. That you could yes, get, there was yeah. like the old DL you could get. Subarus have always had all-wheel drive. Mm -hmm. so. No, well, no, well, most of them had. Most of them, yeah. Uh, the Toyota. Um, uh, there was a couple Toyotas Be that had all-wheel no, drive. No, 80s before those. Those weren't around quite yet. There was. There were. The, what are you talking about? The Celica. Um, had all-wheel drive. It was the the turbocharged. Um, oh. oh yeah, that car, the uh, Celica. Not a Celica. It was the. It was uh, a Celica. The, was it the two-door yeah, Celica? Car. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah, they built that. My cousin had one. Um, that had all-wheel drive and turbo. Uh, and so then that's two. So you got Subaru and you got uh, Toyota. Mm-hmm. And then and you're talking about the, you said the late cars. 80s cars. Yeah, like yeah. Like, no, let's, say, let's say 80s. Well, 80s. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you're talking about the 80s, then you're talking about. Ooh, it's before... There weren't many. No, there weren't many. Mitsubishi may have had the... And I'm not talking about you could get a Scout that was all-wheel drive. These are like SUVs. Like the early SUVs were, of course, all-wheel drive. Mm -hmm. The Grand Wagoneer yeah, that had all-wheel yeah, yeah, drive. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking I'm, about pure I'm cars. Trying to, I'm trying to think out yeah, loud. Pure but cars. Yeah, um, yeah so some of the early... Oh, uh, there was Mazda. A Mazda had the Mazda 3 Turbo all-wheel drive. That came along early, yep. Yeah, that was another really rare case, though. How about the AMC? 
Well, yeah, I guess you could say that. That was four wheel drive, not all wheel drive. The eagle. Well, that was sort of. Yeah, yeah. the eagles. Yeah, and there were yeah. a variety. There were like three different types of eagles. Yeah. Uh, a Koopa wagon and whatnot. There, um, there was. There was also. What was the first car with four wheel drive? Well, Audi. No, before the Audi. Quattro existed back then. That was that, they, the uh, Audi Early. Quattro just started like late at the end of. Quattro system came around like 89 or 90. No, 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 no. It was early. Well, no, no, no. It was earlier than that. No, I Googled it. It was earlier than that. Google it. Yeah, all right. While I'm doing Google that, you, you talk about the other car. Uh, it was a Jensen Interceptor. <laughs> yeah, the Jensen. That was the first car. Which had, by the way, drive. a 440 Dodge engine, I believe. Yeah. Um, hold on. Uh, what, so, Google when the first Quattro came out. Not like in race form, but actually in, you know, you could buy at the dealership. Okay, while I'm doing that, why don't you read on the next one? All right, so I'll go down. Anyway, air. my point was that if you wanted an all-wheel drive car when I was in high school, you had very few choices, if any. Uh, very few choices. Wow. debuts in 1980. Okay. Yeah, the original Audi Quattro competition car, da -da, and then the Jenna Rally in 1980. And then... Hold on, that, did that come to America? And then in 19... That may be the Europe-only car. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, we'll figure it out. All right, I'll keep going down this yeah. list. Now, there's a whole bunch of Teslas on this list, uh, and you know why, Nathan. Well, yeah. Because it, because Mr. Musk decided to drop the prices. Like really? crazy, and there's a lot of people who are furious about that, too. So, uh, let's see. So, number four, I think I'm getting lost in the numbering, so please excuse me, is a Tesla Model S, 24% uh, uh, down from 75000 down to 56000 Oh, my God. I feel I feel for all you guys and gals who bought the Plaid at like 130000 <laughs> which is now, last time I checked, available for, you know, high 80s, maybe low 90s. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Um uh, uh, and I also feel, I also kind of feel bad, and this may actually end up hurting uh, Tesla more than anybody else, uh, like the, the rental car companies, because Hertz bought a boatload well, a of- a ton of them. And, and those guys have like, you know, a, a residual value that they, you know, have down in stone when they buy the car. Mm -hmm. And then when Tesla goes and drops the price of the Model 3 and the Model Y by, you know, 20%, those residuals go right out the door and it stops making sense. So I think, I think Hertz has come out and said that the repair costs were too high, which yeah. I can see. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the fact that they dropped the prices, they're not going to buy anymore or they're certainly, you know, curtailing. I, I have a feeling if they're going to stick with EVs, they're going to move to a different, they may move to the Korean automaker or they may, may even Chevrolet possibly at some point in time. By the way, 1983, I win. Okay. What was the first, what was the car? It was, it was the, the, the Quattro, the actual Quattro, the, the two-door coupe. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo, right here, two door coupe, two, this, but the the American version of that, which is the steering wheel on the other side. Wait, the, wait, that's a, that, is that the race car that two hundred fifty thousand dollar one? No, it's this. Look, sorry, he's gonna put his glasses on while he's doing that. Let's go into um, Tesla Model S. Mid-engine Audi Quattro? No, no, no. That's the race one. Go further down. You can look into the American production down here. Okay, while he's doing that, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. North American oh. market sales of the Quattro in North America began in 1983 model year. They entered all-wheel drive market, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and they went up against the Subaru, uh, Leon, and some of the other stuff that was... Uh, I still think you're talking to Europe-only cars. No, it's just not North American market here. Okay, all right. God. All right. Tell, look, I was in middle school when I saw my first Quattro. And that was around that time. All right. All right. Uh, Tesla Model X is next. Uh, dropped 26.2% uh, from 83,000 down to 61,000. Uh, I, I actually wouldn't buy a used Tesla right now because uh, the new ones have become so. Well, that's the problem. Yeah. And, and so this this overinflated market, which, by the way, I have nothing. I have nothing but admiration for the technical aspect of Teslas. I think they're fantastic cars. They're fast and they're cool and all that. But the issue is, is that they haven't really changed over the years. So an awful lot of people who have these used ones keep thinking, well, you know, that, that value is going to last a while because it hasn't really changed much. Uh, sorry about that value, man, because it's not going well. No. Uh, Chevy Bolt, down 20 used Chevy Bolts, 28%. Uh, from 28,000 to 20,000. I think that has that, that a lot to do with the fact that all the early Chevy Bolts had bad batteries. Yeah, which were replaced uh, and they were taken care well, of, but also in addition... Well, maybe. The, the car... Well, we, we, they, they said so. They well, said. I mean, I mean, if, you, if you're an owner and you didn't have it replaced, it wasn't replaced, right? The, G General Motors didn't come to your house and force you to replace it. I'm sure a lot of owners, obviously, but I'm sure when there's also... you have also a mandatory recall and if you haven't responded to it, then there's a question of liability down the line with you, the former owner. So that's, that's a totally different a podcast. Uh, Tesla Model 3 is the highest level of model of Tesla 
in terms of price drops because it dropped 30.5 percent from $48,171 in October 2022 to $33,455 yeah, yeah, yeah. in 2023. Yeah, we paid, uh, I think, over $55,000 for Model 3 Performance, which is which you can now buy before the new Highland comes out to America, whenever that will be, mm. which you can now buy in the high 40s. So yeah. know, we, we're part of that. We've lost a lot of money on our Tesla. Um, and, you know... What are you going to do? Well, I want to make it into a pickup truck and make a better cyber truck. But so that's, been, that's been done already. I know, but I want to do it anyway. So the last one on this list, number one, actually, mm. a, a little bit surprising, is the Nissan Leaf. Massive drop of 30.6%. Uh, price in October 22, remember, it used uh, $28,304. Now, or sorry, as of October 2023. <laughs> why, why are you surprised? That's the buzz. $19,649. And here's why I'm Nathan, a little surprised. That, that's the buzz kill of electric cars. <laughs> it, it really is. Um, this is a car that was relatively stable in the market, I thought. And uh, I had no idea it dropped this much, that quickly. And it just doesn't make any sense for anybody to go out there and buy a 2024 model, which has no difference in performance, really. Uh, so I would highly recommend now, if you wanted to use Nissan Leaf, now is the time to get one because look at this, they're under 20 grand. So there it is. Yeah, there it is. Um, um, you know, we should talk about this before we finish up this podcast in the last 10 minutes. Mm. We've, you know, we've had a lot of news recently. Um, just this week, uh, GM said that they're pulling back from... Uh, Mary Barrow said that they've kind of messed up the uh, introduction of their Ultium, Ultium batteries. Oh, do you think? Uh, that they, it's taken them too long to roll it out. Oh, she's, uh, they royally, royally butchered it. Honestly, look, Mary Barrow, i got nothing against you personally, but I think you need to go. And um, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and sorry, no, Mary, Mary I, I, I disagree. I'm a big no, fan. It's, it's, you got to throw somebody <laughs> under the bus with these types of miscalculations, and I think it's high time that they have new leadership. She's, she's very much loved. Apparently, people at GM think that she's... I have nothing against her personally. It's just, and, you know, the, the predictions she's made have not come true. And, and ironically, um, GM stock went up quite a bit. Which is strange. But, well, <laughs> what, that's what a buyback, it? too. There's a lot of stuff going on with that, too. Well, and then, of course, Ford, um, you know, is, is also uh, announcing that they're not going to invest as much in their electric vehicles. They're and still I, investing. They're the throttling back, but they're not completely pulling their foot off the accelerator. I, I was watching, reading a list the other day of cars that are, you know, on dealer floors the longest and the lightning is one of those mm -hmm. i know it's not a car it's a truck but you know it's not selling uh, and i loved our lightning so yeah, well they asked too much money sorry that's that's the bottom line too Look, much money not enough battery what they all figured out including mary barra and isaac you probably are here too on this one too much money for electric vehicles. They did not bother coming in at the low end to try to get people into electric vehicles before slapping them with 50, 90, 80, whatever, thousand dollars on these vehicles. And it was ridiculous because they became rich man toys as opposed to vehicles that could help the public. And they really could help the public for people who don't care about internal combustion and just want to get to work. There's potential there. But no, everybody else had to go to the high end. So that's my personal opinion, but I think I'm right. In addition, right now, EV sales across the board, with one exception, are tanking, are not doing very well. Uh, what's the exception? Hyundai. Hyundai, Kia have managed uh. to do pretty well with their combined EV sales. They've actually started building a brand new factory for all EV in Korea just now. The Ionic 6 is not doing so well. The Onyx 6 is not doing well. It's ugly. That's the it's problem. a sedan, yeah. 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 But, but in I, was addition, I was worried about that when I was in Korea. Yeah, it, they basically have to be crossovers in order to sell. I yeah. don't know why. Uh, but for the most part, they, they are staying on it. And here's the good part. They aren't just saying, well, we're only going to build EVs, which is where GM was going with it. They're like, oh, no, we can build plug-in hybrids and we can build regular internal combustion. They're combining everything, and I think that that is the smartest way to go. Toyota, to a lesser extent, is doing the same thing, and I, they're going I, heavy on hybrid. I think Toyota is the one that's laughing the most because they were always – in the EV world, Nathan, uh, I'm sure you know this, Toyota is much hated because they've been, according to EV lovers, uh, fanboys, fangirls, been dragging their feet. But mm -hmm. maybe it turns out that they were in the right spot to begin with, as we're now seeing with... In terms of market, yes. In terms of, you know, mandates with clean energy and all that other stuff, not so much. However, Toyota is on the forefront of introducing solid-state batteries, and they're looking at Yeah, doing... I don't believe that. They said that... They what said, do you, you know, what do you mean you don't believe? I don't, they, they, how the, can you the, say that? The latest news is that they're, they just said 
and downgraded their estimates that at most, at most, okay, they're mm-hmm. going to build 10,000 vehicles with solid state batteries and get this in 2030. They're going to, that's like for Toyota, that is, you know, a day's worth of production. Yep. One day's worth of production, six years, Do you seven know years. Why from they now? downgraded? There's a very simple reason because they want to continue building plug in hybrids and hybrids. No, I just, I just think, they the, think that the, the tech push... isn't there yet. It's just, no. it's just elusive, you know, perfect battery and it, 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 you know, it's like fusion. I remember when I was a kid, sorry, when I was in high school, right? Fusion was going to come uh, and save the world. Hydrogen fusion, right? And we still, you know, we still have atomic reactors, no fusion. What's, what happened with fusion? What, what happened with that? Well, I'm sure Tommy's Clean working energy. on dark fusion right now in his, in his room. It's, but it's, it's the same way with, you know, salt state batteries. No, I, I disagree with that 100%. But regardless of that, there's also, by the way, other new battery tech and officially uh, sodium ion batteries are now being put into production in smaller uh, cases and they're progressively working their way up and those will be another one to, to look for in the future. But my point going back to it, very simple, the fact that uh, they made electric vehicles, only a few of them somewhat obtainable for people who have limited incomes was exactly the wrong direction to go. And now they're paying the price because they have expensive EVs that are paperweights on car lots. And it's going to stay that way until they get together, all of them, including General Motors, and figure it out and make it accessible even at a loss to people who don't have a million bucks in the bank. Yeah, I don't buy that at all. I completely disagree. Sorry, I dude. completely disagree. I, I completely disagree. I, I don't think that the cost, I, I, that's the first thing people point at when they say the reason, I think, you know, what, what you're arguing is if, if Henry Ford came around again and made an affordable electric vehicle that everybody would jump on top of it. I disagree. Uh, I th- I, really? I, because they actually went and did that. Ford went and built the Maverick. The Maverick is completely sold no, I said out. electric vehicle. But, but, electric. But, but hear my electric. point. Electric. They were, that's an affordable vehicle that gets extraordinarily good right. gas mileage. If Ford was able to pull that same trick with an all-electric vehicle... You still would have a mind-bogglingly horrible national charging network and an impossible pl- way to charge your vehicle if you're an apartment dweller because those yes. apartment dwellers, which is where a lot of people with low incomes live, Nathan. So, yes. so I don't think that building a cheap EV is a solution. I think the solution is actually making it convenient and making it... That is part of that is and none part of that of exists right now. It uh, is if, starting to if, exist. If you're like you know like us, uh, or you know consider yourself middle class and you can actually have a house and you can go and plug it in at home, great. But vast majority of people don't have that. If you live somewhere in the country, it's very hard. If you live in an apartment, it's very hard. And God help you if you want to try to cross country. The thing is, we have both found out yeah. it's a, it's a huge pain in the tuchus. It is a pain in the butt to do that. But uh, the reality is, is that they are progressively working their way over towards it. And we it's, are still in the... Progressive, but what's the point of progressively? If I can get You a, can't flip a switch and change everything overnight. You can't take an apartment complex, knock it down, and build it up with a right, new but, charging but thing. But I'm, I'm saying... You if, have to do that over I'm time. I'm going to buy a car this week or this month. You know, why would I buy an electric car if I have I'll one car very, and I need to cross country? Okay, all right, why, all right. why would I buy it? Real quick, here it is. Very simple. Okay. Here's a kid that I know, and he works at groceries at Kroger, okay? okay. He needed a really cheap car. He bought an $8,000 Nissan Leaf. He cannot charge it at home because it's an apartment area. So he's able to take it to work, and he charges it at work for free, by the way. And he drives it around, and it's just basically his car to go back and forth. He has a family of four. He's the sole provider of that family. He's the only one who can actually manage to get that vehicle charged for no money. He spent almost no money on anything other than tires in the past year. He's been talking to me regularly, and he is the guy who, by the way, I, I, I think I, it's dangerous. No, 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 you, no, no, you're not listening to me, letting me finish. There's plenty of ways that people can make it work, and there are plenty of ways that people who have limited means can make it work, but it will take time for various places to get the infrastructure going. The infrastructure is a whole different argument, and I agree it sucks right now, but it has improved and it is improving. So I, I don't know if you can draw broad conclusions from one use case, but I appreciate that the guy did get you know a leaf and I wish him more power. Here's another thing that absolutely is mind-boggling. I was listening to some of the, uh, and I won't name names, uh, fanboy podcasts, you know, uh-huh. EV podcasts. There's a bunch of them, and I really enjoy them. Uh, and then last week, the news was, of course, that Tesla is charging a congestion charge on top of... Uh, yeah, and I think that's ridiculous. Places, you know what I mean? Where mm-hmm. you're going to pay uh, not uh, 50 uh, cents a kilowatt hour, but a dollar fifty a kilowatt hour, basically tripling the cost if you charge beyond ninety percent. Not mm-hmm. in all places, but in some places. Um, and the reason that is completely ridiculous is if I'm going to buy a, 
an EV and now I have a penalty every time I go to fill it up. It'd be like going to your local gas station and saying, well, it's very busy today. So instead of $3 a gallon, we're going to charge you $9 a gallon. That's just and all the, that, all the, that and, is and ridiculous. All, and here's I agree. The thing, all the EV people were like, "Yeah, it's about time." I'm like, "You're you're just if your goal is to have EV adoption, this is not about time. This is the most you know stupid thing I've ever heard of. Mm-hmm. Why would you buy a car that if you want to fill it up at the most convenient time to you, which is going to be when you like this is going to happen in like LA, right? Mm-hmm. When you when you're coming from work or yep. going to work, all of a sudden if you want to fill it up to ninety beyond ninety percent because you need to go a little bit further." Then you're going to pay, you know, triple the amount per kilowatt hour. It's just mind-boggling. Anyway, Nathan, we have we have wasted another hour as the car. We have indeed, Isaac. I apologize once again for bringing your right name up far too much, but I will try to clean up my act maybe sometime in 2028. Uh, and thank you guys for listening. We really do appreciate you, Isaac. <laughs> and keep in mind, you know, sometimes with us, if you send us an email, it's like poking the hornet's nest. <laughs> you're going to get the, my fault. The opposite of what you're trying to accomplish. But I really appreciate that you're a fan, and I really appreciate you guys and i really appreciate the chance that i get to sit here and rant uh, and i know um you know uh, sometimes i come across <laughs> as being a know it all and yeah being conceited, and i'm working on it that's all i'm gonna yeah, say it's we're not perfect and we we are ever evolving i uh, will think of uh, more jokes that are absolutely inappropriate and, and for if next you guys week. want to know more about the tacoma and the Cybertruck, oh, where should they go they should go to altfl.com because that's where you're going to find it and we have more coverage than anybody else on the brand new Toyota Tacoma. So check it out. And Nathan and Andre will be, you know, doing nothing but talking about the new Cybertruck and the Tacoma on their podcast, Talking Trucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you'll find that at all TFL or wherever your favorite podcasts are. Not sold. <laughs> Have a good week, guys. Please be careful <laughs> out there. See you guys next Take time. Care.